Oh, hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. I'm your host, Cindy House. Thank you for joining me today on this podcast. Hope uh, you are holding on okay. Excited about our guest today, Anjimali Chitambu, who uses his first name on stage, just goes by Anjimali, is a genderqueer black singer-songwriter making his way onto a larger radar with the debut album Giver Taker. The artist appeared on some high-profile Best of 2020 lists like NPR and picked up two recent Boston Music Awards. Originally from outside Dallas, Jimmy was raised by Malawian parents. Father was a doctor and mother a computer programmer. His sisters encouraged him to join the choir and taught him harmonies at a young age. The guitar came along around age 10 or 12, and soon an affinity with the instrument began, particularly with finger-picking. Moving to Boston for music in 2011, he developed a drinking problem that led to entering rehab in 2016. During treatment, Jimmy discovered that he was a trans and non-binary person. That realization led to the inspiration for many of the songs on the new record, particularly the song The Maker, which compares a redefinition of gender to one of faith. In talking about the songs, he says, I very much link my queer identity to my spirituality. Talking to Jimmy was a pleasure, and I'm grateful how open he is about his very interesting story. In his experience with taking testosterone, he learned that he'd have to forever change the way he takes care of his voice. That rich, deep sound that you hear coming out of the young performer would no longer be taken advantage of. It was also fun to hear Jimmy talk about his playful side. He said, I think I've always been a dumbass, and once I got sober, I was able to use those powers for good. The music reflects a more serious side that calls to mind Sufjan Stevens, a major inspiration for Jimmy, along with the music from Malawi that his parents would play in the house growing up. Keep your eye on this guy. The new album is amazing. Came out last year, Give or Taker. We'll take a listen to that song, Maker, that we were talking about, and then we will get to our conversation with Anjima Lee on Basic Folk. I live in my own home. I live in my paper. The absence becomes me A reticent specter Oh, oh, why don't you do as you're told? God, I'm a maker. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's like, it's, you know, your new record is so awesome, and I'm really excited to talk to you. Damn, thank you. Yeah. Uh, your parents are originally from Malawi, and they came to the U.S. in the 80s. So what do you know about, like, where they came from, where they lived, and why they came to the United States? My mom is from a more rural area, and my dad's from the city. And they came to the U.S. kind of like the American dream style uh, situation for like more opportunities. And my dad went to medical school in Malawi and my mom, you know, wanted to do like computer programming and stuff. And there just weren't as many opportunities for, I think, advancement in that regard in Malawi. And I think they were just kind of like, fuck it, we out. Right. What kind of doctor is your dad? So my dad is an MD slash like internist. So like just your typical like checkup doctor. PCP. Yeah, he's a he's a PCP for many. Sweet. For you, what was it like to have the culture of your parents and also the culture of the U.S. in your life as a young kid? It was definitely interesting. I'm from Texas, but I, I like I don't really feel super Texan, but I also kind of do. Like sometimes I get a bit of like an accent and I say like howdy 
mostly for like my own amusement than anything else mm -hmm. and also like y'all it just saves a lot of time yeah i mean i think y'all is getting has gotten picked up by the mainstream at this point which is i hope well anyway anyway <laughs> so my parents is a you know they're from a completely different culture than you know texas compared to like quote unquote like white american kids like my parents were like stricter but i don't really think that they were like particularly strict there was just like i remember like going to my my friend my best friend's house and like she was like talking back to her mom and like called her mom a bitch and i was like that's crazy <laughs> like that would never go down you know some parents are stricter than others and i guess her parents also just like weren't oh yeah so there was a there was a lot of like kind of feeling out of place and also just kind of like I think a lot of, I approached a lot of like experiences more in like an observant fashion, just kind of like observing my parents' behavior as a kid and like observing like other American adults and kind of just like internally taking notes, I guess, as kids kind of do. So there's a lot of observation. The junior sociologist. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been there? Um, not since I was like so young that I don't, I don't remember much. I think I was like five or six. We went to visit yeah. our cousins and uh, aunts and uncles. Did you go to the lake? I don't know. Isn't there like a huge lake there? Yeah, Lake Malawi. I feel like because it's so fucking big and because Malawi is so small, I feel like we had to have. <laughs> right. You can't avoid it. But I just remember like mosquitoes. I like really don't. I wish I remembered more as I get older. So it's pretty wild, the origin of your name and Jimily. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to tell that story and also talk about the evolution of your relationship to your name. Yeah, you know, it is pretty buck wild. So what had happened was, okay, one time in like the third or fourth grade, I had an assignment in like my like English class or whatever. And it was like finding out about your history, like find out what your name means, like where your parents are from, like blah, 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 you know, like cute little kids project. So I like go home and I'm like, hey, like what does Aunt Jimily mean? My mom's like, it means denied a boy because when you were born, uh, we wanted a son, but then you weren't. And my sister Grace, when you were born, exclaimed, oh, Aunt Jimily, which means like, oh, denied. And then she proceeded to like cackle <laughs> because <laughs> she's... Just... <laughs> she, yeah, and her and my dad started cracking up. And I was like, what the fuck? So I was like super pissed. Um, I was not super happy about that. I was like, what the hell? Uh, and I just remember them like later retracting that. Be like, no, we were just kidding. And I was like, bullshit, I put that, I told, I brought that to school. So, so yeah, that's what my name means. And I remember being like not super jazzed. I was like, that's not funny at all. In retrospect, as an adult, I do think that story is kind of funny like I used to be like okay my name means denied whatever and then as I got older and like queerer I was like oh shit this kind of has like a bigger meaning so when I was like 17 18 I was like I'm like definitely a lesbian and like that's kind of denied a boy kind of because I'm like kind of a butch lesbian at this point so I was kind of like haha jokes on them and then that's how I used to tell that story to people mm -hmm. and then when I was like 23, 24, I was like, hold up. I'm definitely trans. So the joke is hella on them because <laughs> I'm trans mask. So yeah, the, the older I get, the more wild that story of my name becomes. And it's like, it's just, uh, there's like some real weird cosmic, like, I don't, I don't want to say irony, mm. maybe karma. I don't know. There's something going on with that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. I'm interested about your parents, like what you might have in common with them and what kind of parents were they? I, like I read about Saturday morning cleanings, your mom running around the house clapping at people to get up. Um, but like, <laughs> what kind of what kind of parents were they and how do you think that you're like them? Well, my parents uh they were and I think are like good parents. They're like very loving. They're very imperfect and like very wise and um, they're also hilarious. And the older I get, like the funnier I think that they are. Yeah. They're just like, which I think is a fun, a fun part of adulthood is like realizing how like if your parents are lit, big if, <laughs> big if, realizing that they are lit and being like, oh shit, that's so, that's, you're actually mad funny. 
Who's so, but... funnier, your mom or your dad? Oh, I think it's a dead tie. They have different <laughs> senses of humor because my dad has like kind of a dry sense of humor and he's like kind of quiet and then I'll just say some shit. And I'm like, what the fuck? And my mom is like mad, loud and corny, but she also tells like really hilarious, like bombastic stories. So they both tell like, they do storytelling jokes, which like, uh, do people still do that? Does but... it take, take like 10 minutes to get this? joke out yeah and i'm always just like why did you tell me this but then i'm also like that's actually funny as fuck um <laughs> so yeah i think i got my humor from them for sure and my love of music they love music um they've got a bunch of or at least they did in the last like five years or so still have a bunch of like old vinyl records in the garage um they've got a bunch of cds and they were just always playing music and so we were always listening to music which was awesome do they have a good system? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. I remember my dad bragging about that as a kid. <laughs> he's like a tech dad, but right. like a bumbling tech dad. So he's like... Adorable. But, but like, you know, a competent, but somewhat bumbling tech dad. So yeah. Your sisters inspired you to join the choir, and one of your sisters taught you harmonies. What was it like for you to, like, sing with the choir? What made it special? And what about the act of, like, singing with a group did you enjoy? Oh, I think uh, the effect that music has on me is, like, one of, like, euphoria. And so, and that, like, anytime I hear a song I really like for the first time, it's just, like, such an incredible feeling. And I was just always really, like, moved emotionally and, like, physically, like, chills by, like, vocal harmonies I just always felt very like that there was something powerful contained therein and like this collective of humans like working together to create this like beautiful sound mind you I'm talking about like middle school choirs <laughs> like, <laughs> but I was like wow this is incredible and then my sister taught me like the alto part to heart and soul which she was like learning for a for school and I, I think I was like pretty young like I might have like just started school and I was like, all right, let's do this. I, like, love school. And she, like, taught me the part, and then we sang it together, and she was like, that's harmony. And I was like, no fucking way! <laughs> and I just thought it was really cool. And, like, there's just something very beautiful to me about, about vocal harmonies that I just can't get enough of. What about the guitar? You started playing around 10 or 12 and had a hard time at first, but then were able to figure out how to play it like finger picking style. And it seems like from what I've read, like you bring your guitar with you everywhere. Um, what is your connection and relationship like with the instrument? Um, yeah, you know, I do bring, I do bring my guitars everywhere. I think I, I started playing cause I just thought guitars were cool. I saw like I saw like Prince played guitar and I was like that's super cool and I also liked that it was an instrument that you could harmonize on unlike like a like a wood like a woodwind or some shit. Um, I really love how I feel like they're just like little harps that you can just. I feel like there's a close link to me between vocal harmonies and like guitar chords and so I like the interplay between the two and I really like that like. When I was growing up, I could accompany myself on guitar, so then I could, like... Oh, I needed to play an instrument that I could also sing while playing, which once again, like, ruled out, like, saxophone and shit like that. Um, and it was kind of just, like, the moment I, like, picked it up, like, actually got to play it, I was like, this is super sick. And I was also, like, into, like, MTV and, like, Franz Ferdinand, I think, <laughs> at the time. And I was just like, I want to play guitar like these people play guitar. Like, it sounds cool. I want to do that. Your experience coming out as a lesbian when you're a teenager sounds like it was not great, like in terms of support from those around you. But yeah. I'm wondering, like, given that you have since come out as trans mask, how did you feel about like revealing that about you? Like in terms of like when LGBTQ plus people come out, there is often this like sense of relief. But what was there for you? And the first time I came out, it kind of sucked. I mean, my, my friends were like, yeah, dude, we know. And I was like, yeah, whatever. 
And it was kind of so casual that I came out to my parents really casually, which which was a big mistake. And so that experience was like just sucked. The fallout from that was like a rift between my parents and I for like years and years. Um, and so like when I realized I was trans, I was kind of like, son of a bitch. I was like, a part of me, I mean, a part of me was like, hell yeah, like this is great. But then like when I would think about the fact that I would eventually need to come out to my parents, I was like, not again with this shit. So it was like a whole fucking thing. And um, I actually came out to them pretty recently. It was like a couple months ago. I like wrote a letter. I didn't really tell them a lot about the record or the record deal or like <laughs> any of that stuff. But, but I was like, I think I should probably come out to them before this record comes out. So they don't like read it, you know, in like Rolling Stone or some shit. So that's so that I did. And it actually went really well. Gosh, I would never want to have to come out twice. It was a real pain. I was like, man, I did this 10, it was 10 years ago that I came out as a lesbian. And I was like, damn, am I going to come out 10 years from now? What else is there left? I'm right. sure there's so much more. <laughs> what else will, you'll, will your name reveal to you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'm curious to hear more about is your love of punk music. Um, like what drew you to it and how do you think it impacted you at the time and how you feel about it now? Oh boy. All right. So what had happened was I was really into Blink-182 in middle school. I like remember I even like played a little concert for my parents at one point after they got me like a mic and a mic stand and like made them listen <laughs> hey guys, to me. check this out. Yeah, it was like a check half hour Check out these amazing concert. songs. <laughs> exactly. And they just like sat there, which in retrospect is hilarious and also really sweet. But I was sick playing the, the Blink-182 discography. So in my guitar uh, learnings, I realized that like Blink-182 songs are like all the same chords. And for some reason that like really upset me and I felt like betrayed. <laughs> I was like, how could this be? Um, and so I was like, I can't listen to this anymore. I'm tired of this pop punk. I'm ready to move on to punk. <laughs> and so this was also around the time I started like skateboarding and I used to go on a skating message board and like there was a music section and people like talked about music and I started delving into the history of music genres that I was interested in. And so I like, I did a deep dive into punk. I remember being like, okay, like what, what is actual punk? Like, what is that technically? And the internet was like dead Kennedys, like circle jerks. And I was like, sick. And so I just started like listening to all these fucking punk bands, like Leftover Crack and Black Flag. And like, there was just so much, like early AFI, I just kept digging and digging like back in time. And then I started listening to like classic pop punk, which was in my opinion, still a harder core punk than like modern pop punk. I also had like a lot of semantic issues with like genre labels and I thought I was like the most hardcore 14 year old basically because of my alternative music taste and I was like man everybody everybody is a poser except for me right that's how it works <laughs> uh and like yeah so I listened to punk a lot and I have different feelings about punk now like as I've come to like age and realize how like white and man dominated it is like that's not super cool and so I'm less interested, but there's still like, I actually still do regularly listen to a bunch of hardcore punk, but I think it kind of facilitated my like teenage rebellion, which for me was mostly as an early teen, just like kind of wearing wristbands. But I thought mm -hmm. it was really rebellious to do so. Like yeah. a wallet chain. I was like, mm -hmm. look at me go. Yeah. I used to put lipstick on my eyelids and call myself goth. So nice. <laughs> Do whatever you need to do to nice. get through high school. <laughs> well said. You moved to Boston in 2011 for school. Yeah. How'd that go? What was that move like? Um, you know, in retrospect, it was pretty flippant. I was like, I need to get the fuck up out of Texas. So I just applied to Boston schools. And one of my favorite ska punk bands at the time, Big D and the Kids Table, mm -hmm. is from Boston. And they had just come out with this record talking about how awesome Boston was. And I was like, fuck it, I'm out of here. And I got into Northeastern and like, I went up for orientation with my mom and I was like, cool, looks good. And then like two months later, I like packed up all my shit and moved there. <laughs> wow. I was like, shit, cool. I like, <laughs> was like dragging all of my bags to the dorm from, <laughs> from the cab. Like I just had so much shit. I like shipped my guitar because I was afraid they wouldn't check, they wouldn't like gate check it, which they do. Oh, right. Right. Um, smart. I was like, this guitar needs to get there. 
so I like paid a bunch of money to ship that and like I just kind of relatively flippantly was like okay I'm I live in Boston now (laughs) do you how do you approach like big decisions like that generally is it kind of like a quick decision for you or do you like to mull things over um as an adult I would not do that (laughs) like that again I think it just happens to be a matter of luck that everything turned out super chill up here because I did not do a ton of research. I was like, my favorite band is from Boston. I'm going to Boston. Like there, <laughs> I didn't right. tell my parents that. And so I did, I did have other reasons that I said that probably sounded pragmatic, but were less important to me than the fact that my favorite band was from that. Cause my parents are super like pragmatic. They wouldn't just be like, Oh, your favorite band is from Boston. See ya. Like they would need like, <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure I told them some shit that made sense, but I, as now I would never do that. I would like, you know, look up the demographics, like look up what the communities are like. Like, right. I wouldn't just pack up and bounce. Man, I love a quick decision though. That makes me excited to hear about that. But yeah, also was... <laughs> totally respect the fact that like you should research about, that was really irresponsible <laughs> of you, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> So in 2016, is that when you checked into rehab? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, like, again, you have a lot of great quotes from your interviews. And one of them, you said, I had a lot of shame and guilt that created an emotional, psychological, and spiritual block, but also a creative block. So you left town, you went to Florida. Yeah. What was your attitude going into rehab and how did that change over the course of the experience? Yeah, my attitude was pretty like, I need help real bad. And like, I had been hospitalized several times that year before that last stint. But for, I would say, but for the grace of God, I was like, actually, like the last time I was hospitalized, I was just totally like depleted. I was like, damn, I really don't have anything left to go here with this. Like, I just felt, I felt bad enough to stop. And yeah, like gladly, the kids call it rock bottom. And I hit that later in that, like, in that experience, one of my, like, therapists was like, you have the gift gift of desperation. And I was like, fuck you, man. What the (laughs) fuck? (laughs) But now I'm like, okay, yeah. Because without that, for me, like, without that desperation or rock bottomness, I wouldn't have discontinued, like, abusing drugs and alcohol. I would have continued to do that. So by the time I got to rehab, they were like, hey, uh, you know, do you want to go to psych? And I was like, yes, take me to this specific psych hospital. Don't take me to that one or that one. Take me to this one. Because you researched. Because I had been by that point to like many in the local area. Oh, I see. Area. Okay. And I was like, this one sucks. I don't want to go back there. Take me to the fucking nice one. And so they, t- they took me to the fucking nice one. And the doctors there were like, basically uh, after that point, at any time any doctors asked me or suggested anything that might help me, I was like, okay. Because I was like, I've been, because I had been like running the show at that point for like many years and I had like run the show into the ground Mm. and I was like, I don't think I have good ideas. (laughs) And I like realized that and I was like, so, and I also clearly don't know how to and can't help myself right now. Mm. So I'm going to defer to like medical and mental health professionals. And so that's what I did. Wow. Wow. Was it during treatment that you realized that you were trans? It was before treatment and it was actually like during treatment, I didn't like disclose that because I had had like experiences disclosing that in the recent past that just did not go well. And I was like, and it kind of felt like barriers to like entry. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't really feel like revealing this information and then getting like hella misgendered or like people asking me weird fucking invasive questions. Right. And so like. Like I'm doing right now. (laughs) Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> I'm think I'm just this, kidding. <laughs> no, not at all. People be asking real, like, you'd be surprised how fucking weird people are, Ooh. especially doctors. But anyway, I just didn't disclose that. And I was like, yeah, I'm a girl, uh, whatever. And like, and also the halfway houses that I later went to were gendered and like are all gendered, except for like a very small minority. So I was just kind of like, it's weird to say, but I kind of just like put my transness on the back burner. Because I was like, okay, this definitely sucks and is whack, but also I am dying and I'm going to focus on one 
thing at a time. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is a situation where you kind of have to, when you have something like that, you have to kind of like read the room about like making a decision as to whether or not this is going to be a good idea to tell people. Yeah. You know? Wow. Okay, so the songs on the record, it sounds like most of them were written before you came out as trans or before you realized you were trans? Let me see. I think uh, definitely, I'm, I would say like half or less. Writing songs for you before you made the realization and before you came out as trans, like how has that process changed for you after you have this new freedom of clarity and clarity of identity? So I, I honestly think before I kind of was trans, realized I was trans, felt felt comfortable identifying as trans. My songwriting was less, like, serious, I think. I used to write, like, songs about girls and about, like, mostly girls, yeah. <laughs> and, like, kind of teen teenage concerns. Like, I would write about, book, like, songs about books I liked. It wasn't really super deep or anything, you know? Kind of seemed like maybe aimless yeah or just like mostly just love songs and not any self-reflexivity going on which i mm. just hadn't ever considered you know to include mm. and then when i came out as trans this like more or less coincided with like my sobriety and recovery and like as soon as i left florida i was like back to being trans like to telling people i was trans because i was back in boston on like a safe safer space where i could do that Mm -hmm. And like with with my return post rehab, my capacity and propensity for emotional reflection had just improved tenfold, uh, mostly thanks to a fuck ton of therapy. Mm. And before that incredible amount of therapy, I had like been going to weekly therapy for a couple of years. But before that, I wasn't really emotionally intelligent at all. I didn't like understand how to deal with painful emotions or how to accept painful emotions or how to live through painful emotions in like a non-reactionary and or an antagonistic to others way, which is like really unhealthy. And so all of that kind of was addressed to the max in rehab and, you know, continues to this day. And like, I'm a more mature adult, but my songwriting just got, I think, more honest and more meaningful because I wasn't writing just because I was like kind of bored and looking for something to do. It changed to me writing because I was having an emotional experience that I needed to record and put down on paper to help me with my processing and self-soothing. The song, The Maker, which, whoo, I don't know how you wrote that, man. Um, <laughs> you know what? Me neither. <laughs> yeah, the, from what I understand, yeah, there's that. <laughs> it's a great song, incredible. Um, it compares a redefinition of gender to one of faith. And in talking about the song, you said, I very much link my queer identity to my spirituality. Can you expand more on that and how you came to that conclusion? Yeah, I think that that's something that has made itself more apparent to me, like, post-rehab, which it really freaks me out that I wrote that song, mm. <laughs> honestly. But, um, so when I was in rehab, I developed a sense of spirituality. Like, it was suggested to me that that could help me with my sobriety. And I was like, okay, I'll take these suggestions. And so I kind of developed, like, a Colors of the Wind style spirituality to, like, you know, hold on to and, like, turn to for Like the support. Disney song? Yes, Yes. Precisely. Yes. <laughs> Classic. And um and so that was that that was then like a safe inner space that I created and like is now a space where I like, you know, meditate and still engage in like colors with the wind style hippie bullshit. And so after rehab, I was back in Boston and in addition to just being super glad to not be in Florida anymore, there was like a big breath of fresh air. I was like, finally I can be trans here. And it was like such a huge wave. I'm just like, oh my God, every, like my friends know my pronouns, like my real ones. And like, I can actually be myself here now, like completely and also soberly, which is super great for myself and every, everybody else involved. And so that felt like a huge upheaval in the same way my like, I guess like I'll call it spiritual awakening and rehab felt like a huge upheaval 
and I kind of realized that like the, the feeling of freedom and joy that I get when I like have like a good meditation session or like have a nice like walk outside in the sun is the same sense of freedom and joy I get when I like think about my queerness or when I experience like queer euphoria and realize that I'm like free which is not something that I was as a teen or even in like, you know, rehab, unfortunately, when all this dope stuff was happening, I was still like kind of trapped in a way. And so I feel like I feel free and that feels like a a spiritual experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's lovely. Your voice is so central to your sound and has actually experienced its own kind of change, yeah. spiritual change. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and due to like, testosterone you were taking when transitioning um how did you react to your changing voice and how does it feel to sing now versus before yeah so my first reaction was like oh shit in every sense of the word because I was like woohoo like yay like now my voice kind of like matches more of how I feel on the inside in terms of my gender expression and identity is that your speaking voice or your singing voice uh both both I was like, sweet, my voice is lower. That's super cool. And I was also like, oh my God, my voice is lower. Shit. Because my it, it had a huge and profound impact on my singing voice that I knew was going to happen and wanted to happen, but was still like really frightening and stressful. Because so, like I basically had to like relearn how to sing and I was pretty salty about it. <sighs> like I, I was quite salty. And uh, it was like upsetting to recognize that I had like like I remember I played a show in my buddy's apartment and I sang like a Radiohead song I forget oh yeah I sang like nude and I was like I know that this is the last time that I will ever be able to sing this like this because I won't ever be able to sing this high again and if I and if I can it won't sound like this and so there was like a there's definitely a mourning that occurred mm. when I like lost my upper register and you know I used to like sing in the choir and I was like a second soprano alto which is like you know lowish high-ish. My voice was just way higher and I was used to singing in in a specific way and I felt that I had a level of vocal mastery due to like years and years and years of choral training and vocal training uh, in school and I just remember a couple weeks after starting testosterone like opening my mouth to to sing and a different note would come out than the one that I had was planning on (laughs) coming out and I was like what the fuck I always have control over this I don't have control over this so there was like a loss of control that I was like that took a lot of you know reckoning with and like a lot of gentleness so you know yeah I I asked YouTube what to do and they were like just keep singing and you'll learn how to control your new voice were there YouTube videos on what to do if your voice is changing from tea yeah there's like a very large amount and like my roommate at the time was on tea as well so I had like done a bit of research and I was like I know this is going to change I just want to I just want to know like if I will be able to sing at all once I'm on tea because I wasn't sure about <laughs> I was like it'll probably be fine and and this it's like a, it's like a huge subgenre of like YouTube is like wow transitioning and, and there's like there's like videos of guys on t like harmonizing with their older voice there's like Whoa. a bunch of shit it's pretty cool but they were all like just keep singing and i was like okay and i was like i definitely have enough like experience in choirs to be able to like safely approach singing and so i'm going to do that and in order for me to do that i need to be really gentle with my voice and not push it and keep singing so that was the deal how has that experience change the way you might think about care for your voice as you get older? (sighs) Well, I think my voice is so much more fragile than it used to be, but also more powerful, which is interesting. And so just because of the stress on my vocal cords from like them thickening or whatever, I know that I that I need to take care of my voice in a way that I wouldn't have really thought about before. Mm -hmm. Like I warm up before I sing always and I like some days I can sing higher than others and I like I don't push my higher register because I don't want to like break anything you know yeah don't break Um, anything I don't want to break anything (laughs) the fragility of this instrument has been made very clear to me as a result of testosterone well yeah I hope that that leads to some good like longevity for you yeah I think it'll be super chill especially like I now have a lower register that didn't exist and it just keeps getting like lower and wider and so I feel like I feel like what will likely happen is my you know, upper register will decrease with age, but my lower register will like mm. continue thickening out. So I feel like it'll be cool. <laughs> yeah. 
In your sobriety, you developed a keen sense of spirituality and self-worth, which like, awesome. Um, You grew (laughs) up going to a church that you didn't connect with, Presbyterian. Um, But what aspects of that foundation of faith play into the spiritual for you? And also, how do you see your relation to faith working its way into your music? Because I think I was too young to understand what the fuck was going on in church. And there were also really long services. And I was like, I'm five. And I've been here for 500 years. <laughs> and I had to wake up at like 6 a.m. I was like, this, I don't even know what's going on. And you were awoken on Saturday to clapping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hard. Not a relaxing weekend. Yeah, my mom is a freak of nature. But um, <laughs> I think that the best, my best like introduction to faith and spirituality in a positive way was like through the good qualities that my parents have. Like their like wisdom and like kindness and love and like general good heartedness. I feel like those kind those things are like kind of like the basics of all faiths. And if you can kind of do those right, you're you're doing pretty good, I guess. (laughs) Mm. And so those I like took with me and everything else I was kind of like, y'all can keep that. I don't really understand all that. But this I'm I'm still figuring out what spirituality means to me, you know, on a daily basis. It's kind of exciting there's like a there's like a sense for me of like adventure and uncovering like the mysteries of like the universe or whatever. <laughs> I, I watch a lot of Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I think that like my my love of like exploration and just like learning new things that comes across in my spirituality, which then comes across in my music. Like I have a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts, a lot of conclusions, and I, and so I write them down and then I, I sing them. <laughs> You've overcome a lot of shame in your life. Yeah. Which, man, shame is hard. It, when it hits you, it's like a hot knife. What is your current relationship to shame? That's a fantastic question. Something I have been learning over the years is just the concept of being gentle with myself keeps uh, beating me over the head gently. <laughs> and so I kind of have like a defense against shame these days which is like self-compassion. So like my shame receptors are kind of now like couched in this cushion, I guess, of self-compassion, which is really helpful because it's fucking hard out here. I mean, it's a fucking pandemic. And there's mm-hmm. just, you know, even without that, there's so much to experience shame for in life. Some warranted, some like unwarranted. And like, I just try to couch it in compassion. Like, for example, like this week, you know, has fucking sucked. And, like, I've just been feeling bad that I feel bad. And so, like, there's that shame of, like, oh, I should be, like, doing more. Or, like, I should be, like, using social media to, like, (laughs) I don't know, rally the people or something. (laughs) Which I'm not doing. I'm taking a break because I don't have anything to, I don't have anything to say. Except Mm. for for, for, for fuck's sake. And so there's, like, my self-compassion that kicks in that's, like, hey, you know, that's real. And also, this week fucking sucks. And, you know, you're doing the best you can, you know, you're brushing your teeth, you're cleaning your room, you're going outside. Like, some weeks are easier than others. Sometimes I have more energy than other times. And this week I'm kind of drained. So I'm like, I kind of am, I'm able to recognize when I'm like working with like less, like if I'm working with less spoons, I guess, then I'm going to do less. And when I have more energy, I try to do more. And um, so, yeah, I, I try to like, counter my shame with like some compassion some reason i'm like a a pretty i I do a lot of talking to myself basically (laughs) uh the song your tree kind of refers to your family tree um which means a lot to you and for you it wasn't always guaranteed that you'd be part of your family as a queer and trans person in a conservative house yeah and that's something that a lot of lgbt btq plus kids deal with and it can be very scary to reckon with that fact to lose your family over who you are how much did that impact your decision to live your truth and be honest with your family about who you are honestly not as much as i would hope that it would like i came out to my siblings and that was pretty easy but like if it hadn't been for the record release i probably would have put off coming to my parents coming out to my parents i feel like my desire to connect with my family There's also a converse, like, feeling of, like, defiance that I should just get to be who I get to be without, like, explanation and without, like, having to make it a big fucking thing. And so there's also a level of frustration there that isn't, like, 
anybody's fault, but rather just like the way that it is. Being a part of my like family tree, honestly, the, the older I get, the less important it is to me. But then like I came out to my parents and like my dad was just so sweet and it kind of has now shifted that belief system again where I'm like, maybe my family is not so bad. Or That's like, great. You know, maybe, maybe there are things worth keeping, worth saving, worth uplifting in this yeah. very complicated family tree. You have a very playful side of your personality. First of all, it's super fun to talk to you. We've been talking for an hour and it's very <laughs> fun. <laughs> you call yourself a boy king. And also, these are just some examples of your playfulness. And during interviews, sometimes you describe being happy as like heart eyes emoji. Instead of saying like, I was super happy, you would say like, I was heart eyes emoji. And you kind of just like give off this like silly, fun bro vibe. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. But... I I know what you're talking about. <laughs> How did you cultivate that side of yourself? Well, I think I've always been a dumb ass. And I think that, you know, once I got sober, I was able to use those powers for good. And I don't know, I've always just kind of been a bit of a dumbass. I like, uh, you know, joking with my buds. My family is very like, one of the ways we show love is just by making fun of each other. And so I kind of just like fucking with people. And it's, and in like a nice way. When I was like a teen, I used to like fuck with people in like a not nice way, like, mm -hmm. which is not cool. And so, so as I get older, I just like become more of a dad, basically. Mm -hmm. And I like the prospect of injecting silliness into into a conversation and kind of just seeing how far that can go before the other person's like, wait, what the fuck? But in like a nice way. <laughs> right. Because maybe you're so kind to yourself that your silliness is now kind to others. Yeah. I mean, I spend, you know. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Boom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jimmy, you want to do the lightning round? Yeah. Is it okay. like for real lightning? Mm, no, it's just like fun question time. Sick. All right, here we go. What was the first song you learned on the guitar? Oh, shit. Yeah, it was Smoke on the Water, I think. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. Yeah. Um, dogs or cats or something else? Oh, uh, hmm. Dogs. I love cats, though. What is your coffee order? Black coffee, ice. What is your favorite country? My favorite country? Yeah. Hmm. Can I say none? Sure. Acceptable. First celebrity crush? Uh... Lance Bass? Who is the nicest musician you've ever met? Yo-Yo Ma. Oh, yeah. He's so nice. I bet he's super nice. What was the first album you bought with your own money? Um, Ling-182, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. What was your first concert? Uh, First real concert was I saw Brand New at some place in Dallas. What was the last book you read? Last book I read. I guess it was the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home from Welcome to Night Vale. Whoa. All right. Flying or invisibility? Flying. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Trek. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? Um, Bald Face Mountain in New Hampshire, up at the top. Sweet. Yeah. New Hampshire had a lot to do with this new record, right? They did. We recorded there, but... Cool. All right. That's the lightning round, Jimmy. You have done it. Sick. Very good answers. Very quick. You uh, were like lightning. Okay. I was trying to be as lightning adjacent as possible. So that's, thank right. you. Right. Sweet. Well, congrats on the new record. Um, it was so fun talking to you and hope to meet you in person one day. For sure. Thank you for your time. Basic Folk This Week was produced by John Nungesser. Our business manager is Lindsay Myers. Laura McCarthy is our social media manager. Our music is by Alex Stanton of the band Townspeople. Basic Folk is part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. You can find all of our episodes at my website, cindyhouse.net, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Uh, and rate and review and subscribe and take care of each other and call your mom and I'll talk to you next time. Okay, bye.